there are so many different species of trees out there that um, that is and even more being created by cultivars that that it's extremely difficult to keep up with a, a list yeah, so a I list. I think if it's more of a guidance um, or a practice so this 300 foot radius that's a standard that we don't really do anything less than that currently for any sort of like planning related notices certain planning notices only require adjacent property owner notification and that was something that was discussed previously and what was the that was discussed at OSEC or planning commission and how did they arrive at 300 in the subcommittee level they arrived at the 300 and i i think they wanted just a broader notice they i think they were concerned with with trees that are exceptionally large where it's maybe not just the immediate neighbors that are are affected that that was their concern and, um, and there are a few trees like that around town where they are quite large and yeah you, you, the loss is felt but uh, so it was a it was a, a some discussion around that and um, that's where they landed okay yeah, I have an additional question um, so you know based upon what is before us if someone I'm just gonna put out this example if someone had a large oak tree or a, or a large bay tree and it was blocking their view and they wanted to get rid of it and so they went through the process uh, of getting an app uh, getting a permit to remove it because it was blocking their view um, is there anything that the city could impose and, and, and deny that person I would say yes you this would be a discretionary process and if if it didn't meet the findings that it, it could be denied and on the converse then the say if the city felt the finding that there was no hardship economic loss or whatever by and we rejected the permit that property owner could appeal that determination as well so to it's appealable on everybody's part they could appeal that as well and say no it is a hardship for me to keep this tree and they make their case and uh, so there's a appeal route either way you go and that appeal then would go to council to the city manager city manager okay and then the city manager would would decide whether or not that person could keep that tree <laughs> or not if the person say you know i this you know i got this million dollar view and but i got this giant tree in front of my deck and um i i'd, I'd like to remove it sir um <laughs> yeah you know um we don't have a view ordinance. that is correct i'm sorry what was your question we don't have a view ordinance. yeah oh. but i mean this is this person's personal property he owns the tree because it's on his land and so um, he doesn't like the tree it doesn't like the tree you know for for me um i mean sure I, you know i'd love to keep all the trees that we can and you know on our property we, we, we got a ton of trees and just leave them they just keep growing <laughs> but uh you know i don't think it's you know our part to tell a property owner if they can't cut that tree down um, I think if we had uh, um, if there were some species of trees that were rare and that we were trying to make sure that we kept the biodiversity um, of that species uh, as part of the ecosystem then yeah we would make every effort possible um, you know maybe perhaps the the re planting of trees uh, could be done somewhere else where maybe um, those trees make better sense growing rather than in someone's backyard um, so I mean I, I I know it's hard you know to cut a tree down we had a eucalyptus tree in, in the canyon next to our house and you know we, our family was concerned that uh, eventually it could snap and land on the house and but there were folks around the, the neighborhood that really didn't want that tree 
down. And, and it was a shock when just David Tree came by <laughs> one day and people were wondering like, hey, what's going on here? How come this tree is being cut down? And it, it, it was hard for them and it was hard for us too, knowing that we had caused that kind of grief. Um, but that tree being cut down then allowed other trees to grow. So, um, Baby eucalyptus. <laughs> well, you know, but it was a very significant tree um, that was important to people in the neighborhood. I mean, that's the thing. People get really attached to, to the trees, whether it's a, a, you know, a native one or, or, or not. But this, this ordinance is trying to differentiate between invasives and heritage trees and, and calling them out as something different. And I think that there are two really different things, the eucalyptus um, being one that, yes, it, they do have a habitat for birds and they have other benefits, but they also have, you know, they have some other inherent issues. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think that the overall the tree ordinance is a good ordinance, um, and I, I don't think it's too much of a taking of personal property rights because it brings in a lot of different reasons where a tree can be lawfully removed. Um, so I would be in favor of moving it forward um, the way it is. I, I like the idea of having a notice on a heritage tree that's going to be removed um, where people can see and people who are out walking the neighborhood that do have an affinity for that tree at least know it. Um, but other than that, I, I think it's it's been really thought out well by the OSAC and, you know, sort of beaten to death by them and the Planning Commission. So I would like to move forward with it, um, and I'm willing to do that as it is. You know, let me just ask you this question, Terry. So say if there was a tree in your backyard and you wanted it removed, and it, say it was an oak tree, you had your own personal reasons for having it removed, and then someone else, you know, got the notice, and said, hey, you know, I really like that tree, you know, I, I'm, you know, 200 feet away, but, you know, when I wake up in the morning, and I see that tree from my deck, I really like your tree, Terry, and you know, I don't want you to remove it. I find whatever, you know, information that's in this ordinance to, to, to put out that, you know, to make that appeal. Um, and then for whatever reason, you know, the city manager says, uh, okay, well, based upon all this information here. You can't you, move the tree. You can't remove the tree. If you, you know. You I mean, know but I, I mean, is that the... fair to you, right, as a, as a, as a property owner? And, I, and personally, I don't, I don't think that it is. So then, you know, then there needs to be something changed in here. Can I can I ask a quick question, real really quickly? Um, page six. There's findings for granting a permit, and one of the things that Cliff brought up was, well, what if it's blocking my view? Well, on item or number two, bullet point C, removal of the tree is necessary for economic or other enjoyment of the property. I think that's okay, like. John. Six? Six. I think that's really vague. Because, like, I can say the enjoyment of my property is being inhibited by this tree blocking my view. That's a finding. So I think because it's so vague, you're saying my view shed, right, is not, is not criteria for, for a finding. But I can easily read this as me having a view is key to the enjoyment of my property. Same thing, like, what if somebody has is allergic to the tree? Or there's a tree that drops, like, there's trees that drop all kinds of things into your yard, whether that be, yeah, fruits or flowers, whatever it may be, mm -hmm. um, that they don't want to maintain the tree for whatever reason due to it growing very quickly or to all the things that it's dropping in their yard. So I feel that, like, you know, that's – I think I can see a big hang-up where neighbors can come unglued 
and there's some type of hearing and it's really going to boil down to item C where someone's going to say, it's critical for me to remove this tree so I can enjoy my property. And then we get into a whole discussion of like what enjoyment really means. You know what I'm saying? Sure. And I think what you're getting at is the tension of this whole, you know, the purpose of the ordinance originally is to balance two things. One is an urban forestry and the public benefit and the environmental benefit of that versus private property rights. And typically you use findings that are an argument can be made either way to sort of uh, judge that. I'm, I'm not sure what you're suggesting. If you delete the finding... No, I'm not. I'm just saying that the finding seems to be vague, so I can easily use that finding, in my opinion, to justify why the tree needs to go. But when Cliff asked, does having a view, is that criteria, that would be no. But I could see how you could use item C to justify me having a view as being part of the criteria. So I just think that enjoyment of the property is such a vague you know, it's such a vague statement that I could I could argue anything. Um, I, I think your point's well taken. I'll, I'll just point out that is in the current ordinance as it's written. We didn't change that wording. It's, it's not added. It wasn't modified. It's in the current ordinance. But if you want to change it, certainly I, I understand the point, And I understand the idea that it is an issue that, two reasonable people could look at the same fact set and, and reach different conclusions. And that happens in many of the kind of planning cases we have and findings. And, you know, that's in a way the nature of the business. But if you have some suggestions as to a higher degree of clarity that you think will achieve your objectives, and we're open to that. Is it the appetite of this council to not make any changes to the tree ordinance or to make that was my original motion <laughs> to not make any d changes just, to the no, original just to accept what changes there were just accept it as it is right now what was recommended that what we're talking about right now was part of the original ordinance and wasn't changed so that's why you know I made a motion to introduce the ordinance and I'm okay with it going forward but then there's a lot of talk about changing this or that, and that's why I ask, what is it specifically you want to change? Because I, I hear a lot of talk about things, but I have no clue of where you want to put it, you know, what you're suggesting. No, I, I understand, and, yeah. and that's why I was saying that after the discussion, I, I do think that it's good to control our environment um, and retain trees because I think they're important to our environment. And I know that this ordinance was intended to help keep the canopy ongoing and vibrant and keep it from being clear, -cutted, clear cut um, randomly. And that I think this gives us a good basis for it. So, I mean, what I like about the language is that it does bring awareness and maybe, you know, it might uh, give a property owner second thought about cutting down that tree or severely trimming it. Um, again, it's, you know, trying to find that balance. Uh, you know, if the, I, I think if the property owner does want to remove the tree, um, <coughs> they remove the tree and plant a tree or whatever if it's three to one for is it three to one for uh her, heritage trees it's um one to one is specified for all discretionary trees and then there's a a a statement essentially that that is minimal and more may be required for perhaps it's that example that you had of a, a large oak tree that's blocking a view that maybe you you allow that to be taken out, but you plant two or three or one larger than a 15 gallon. So, so there's flexibility built in, but it's not a beyond one to one. It's not specified. Yeah, you know, I mean, if there's flexibility to to have that tree planted um, at the you know at the city's um, discretion, rather than having that property owner have to 
plant another tree on his lot if he doesn't want the tree. I mean, I, I think we're just getting a little bit into, I think we're going you know, into the weeds. Yeah. Well, no, I think uh, no. I mean, I think if if you know, we sh we shouldn't be applying more regulation than what is necessary, right? And so, you know, that to me, then you are getting into the weeds, right? It should be just very simple. I agree with Cliff. I think that his earlier suggestion of there are specific protected trees, then that's one thing. But everything that's that's not an invasive, I think that that might be too broad. Did you see what? It, so not every not every non-invasive is protected, right? So I'm concerned about comp telling people what they can do on their private property, and I also think that item C under findings is going to lead to quite a few planning commission showdowns. Um, and I'm okay with keeping it vague because I think someone can argue it to protect their view if they want to. But I'm just seeing that that's going, it's going to come back, I feel, at some point because it's not very clear what what that means. If I may, Madam Mayor, uh, enjoyment of the property is a legal standard that's well established in case law. So can you outline what that would constitute? I'd have constitute? to research it, but it's, we learned it in law. I've never had it come up, but we've learned it in law school under property. We've learned it over many, many Is it in our definitions of our code? Enjoyment no, of property defined, is defined as the X, Y, and Z? Not for purpose of this, but it's defined in cases that go back hundreds of years, probably in this case, at least a hundred something years. I'd be really curious. So to it's know. a legal term. <laughs> it's a legal term. Yeah. It's like shall. Exactly. <laughs> So I would be in favor of um, bringing this back at a later date. I would like to know specifically what enjoyment of property means legally, and I think that that's something that we should outline in our codes as well. A definition, enjoyment of property is defined as this. Correct? We can do that, right? We can. I think you'll end up with a very long code section um what yeah we can and then if if it's not or i'd we'll, we'll i mean i'd like to you. see that yeah so that way you know we can make that determination of like what's appropriate but i think somewhere that should be outlined whether that's our definition or we're going by the standard legal definition but i think it's important to note what enjoyment of the property means and i'm in favor of having this amended so that it is a specific list of protected trees as opposed to every non-invasive tree. Like, are there certain trees, like well, live oak or some, like some well, types of trees? Well, are, on the slide that's right in front of you now, it should be on your screen hopefully, those are what are defined as right. protected trees. So if you want to shorten that list, modify the list, in you know, whatever direction you want to provide. Well, there's only three trees on that list. I think that's... Well, there's three the categories. There's a specific species. Then there's a requirement that if the city required you to plant a tree as part of your development, it may not be a, one of those three. That's considered protected. Say it was a condition of approval. We treat that as a protected tree. And then that whole idea of three or more of any non-invasive is collectively considered a protective tree. So if you want to shorten that list in any manner, that's certainly an option you have. I think that's pretty... Tight. Those three are on here because they're indigenous to this right. area, is, is what the original intent was. Coastal live oak, California buckeye, and uh, California bay laurel. Mm -hmm. you, you know, look, I, I'm fine with the, the things in here. Uh, just that, you know, if, again, if a property owner wants to remove the tree, you should be able to do it. And it sounds like what you're saying, Madam Mayor, that in the findings, the person could probably make that argument. And then, of course, <laughs> are we really, you know, is, is that serving the purpose of, of, of the actual ordinance um, to the to full extent? Um, we want to, you know, we want to keep Brisbane green. And, and, that, and I know that's the intent of, of why this is before us. And um, again, it's got to be that balance. I don't think that we should deny a property owner of being able to remove a tree. 
And if it's one of these three trees, yes, you can. we should. <laughs> I think he can, right? Yeah, I said we. That's the purpose of the order. Yeah, I know. And I, can, I, but should we? Yeah, and I, I don't think that that we should. And so, uh, but you know, we could, I think, uh, require that um, mm. it, with that removal of that tree, they cover the costs of of the city planting two or three of the same species or one of these three in an appropriate place, and and then and then you could keep everything else. I, I just want to add to that. How many times in the last 15 or 20 years has somebody wanted to remove a live oak, California buckeye, or bay laurel from their property? I'm, I'm going to assume we could count it on one hand. There are, there are some, but it's the minority, it's some. A whole lot more pines and eucalyptus, acacias, those, there was a list that took up the bulk, though, that those would probably be the top three. Right. You know, say someone wanted to build an ADU in their backyard. Treehouse. I'm just, I'm just saying, you know. But then if they're going to remove, that would come with, if, if they're going to build a secondary unit, normally that would come with the, they would, come with drawings and where the current trees are, what they were going to remove, and have a specific planting plan applied to that. So that would trigger something else for building and tree removal than just this ordinance, correct? That's, that's correct. There's an exception up, <coughs> up front in the ordinance that, that essentially if, if a tree removal is allowed by another city permit, a building permit, as an example, that their the building permit serves as that Treat. removal. So that removal. that wouldn't be a reason for this ordinance to mm. kick mm. in. Is you couldn't not allow someone to build a secondary unit because they've got a bay laurel. It wouldn't preclude that. So, I'm I'm happy with the way the ordinance is now with the restrictions. I don't think it's overly restrictive to property owners. Okay, I think we're split. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. So then it's nope. I'd like to bring it back and just you know yeah, I would have too. the language. We have and a subcommittee on this. Uh, you know, because I don't. You know, I I truly don't understand what you want to change. I mean, I, I'm not sure if staff clear on it. Staff clear on it, then great. But. <laughs> I, I've really enjoyed the debate. Oh. <laughs> I was like, were we going to go head toe to toe on trees tonight? I, I felt it coming. <laughs> yeah. so we're going to spend way too much um, time on this. Well, I think it's the tension of the issue, as John has stated. Um, if you wanted to have an ad hoc subcommittee for the council to look at it, you could do that. But you know. I would be interested if we did that, too, to have a member of OSEC and a member of planning on that so I can really understand where they're coming from because I think maybe I'm missing I miss I'm, I'm missing that perspective I know I'm hearing it here but I would really like to hear it from the people who worked on this so um, I also you know I could see a situation in us moving forward with it as as written but in the event that it becomes a situation in which we are seeing these like debacles happen around trees and people really not being able to remove trees that are on their property, you know, then maybe that's something in which we we revise the way that it's written. Because um, I'm seeing it go that way, but obviously I don't know what the future holds. I mean, his, historically over the years, I mean, um, it, it doesn't seem like we've had as many um, appeals in recent years as in the past. Um, I remember when I first got here, there was three or four kind of difficult appeals um, and the kind of the approach we always took was trying to work with the property owner to come up with a satisfactory you know resolution but this ordinance is a little bit different and exactly how it would play out you know is kind of hard to, to say hard to say a hundred percent but anyway if you do want to have an ad hoc committee we could bring that back at your next meeting to, to establish that uh, 
because I will say as mayor, I wasn't expecting this, but the calls and the emails that I receive most often are people worried about trees, people wanting specific trees removed, not people saying that they want more trees planted. So until we remove them and then they then we hear from the other side. Yeah, all these people are calling me like, there's a dead tree, it's got to come out. So that's why I can see that there's this, yeah. that this well, that feeling. Well, dead trees should always be able to be removed. Right. Sure. The dead trees right. are, and, and a lot of times that, you know, and it's hard to, from when people get a hold of you to understand whether it's in the right-of-way or whether it's in somebody's personal property. The ones that are in the right-of-way, we have a lot more ability to deal with and right. we do. Um, where we can we do have a, a I think Karen and I talked about this we have we have kind of an orientation to try to save the tree that's been kind of the staff's focus over the years uh, so we take trees out only when they're really absolutely have to be taken out yeah well I'm happy to be on that ad hoc committee um, and I would like to involve somebody from OSEC maybe the chair of OSEC and chair of planning just so I can get a better sense of where their perspective is on this, see if we can't come to some sort of middle ground. So do you want two council members on there? I would say yes. I'll do it. Okay. I think that's we, appropriate. We probably would should bring back the formation of the ad hoc committee to your next meeting, and, and then you can appoint your your uh, okay. members to it at that time and what I'm hearing is oh you want the members of OSEC and and the Planning Commission yeah okay because they were the two bodies that worked on this correct um, I believe so yeah. yeah so in the meantime our current ordinance is still in effect right? it is yeah. still in effect okay. yes sir so we're still safe mm -hmm. okay so um, I, I'm really happy that we're doing this because I'm slightly alarmed that you know safety was not brought up um, prior to tonight and that we need to make sure that each individual property owner's rights are maintained that they're safe from the trees that are planted and that um, the city as a whole is safe from us not losing insurance moving down the road etc cetera, etc cetera. so I'm glad that's now going to be part of the conversation would you like to be on the ad hoc instead not necessarily. Okay. I, I'm Just happy to feed anybody any information they want about safety. Got it. Okay. Well, I think we beat this one to death. Yes. Let's go ahead and move on so we can wrap this up. Okay. So that brings us to staff reports, city manager's report on up upcoming activities. Okay. I'll try to be Oops. quick here. So um, the first item is a compost giveaway um, program that is um, being done by South San Francisco scavengers starting on May 3rd until supplies um, are gone. Um, that's at San Francisco Avenue near Inyo, just below the community garden. So are they just going to have a pile there for people to take their own compost? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Something like that. Yes. It's there now. City, city clerk is saying yes. <laughs> As the pile is there now. It's our garbage turned into compost. Yep. <laughs> I love it. Um, our uh, next uh, Home for All event, uh, Community Conversation 2, is this uh, Saturday at uh, Mission Blue. It starts at uh, 2.30 um, with a nacho bar, and uh, the actual event starts at 3.00. Um, there will also be um, child care available uh, on site. Um, and we are kind of uh, co uh, doing something with the uh, jazz festival at the Seven Mile House. Uh, so um, the people who want to do both events. Okay. How are we doing, by the way, with uh, uh, people signing up for the workshop compared to the last uh, one? I, I don't have those numbers. Well, we mm -hmm. try I asked this. Caroline today, and it seems like there's not as many RSVPs. I would say, like, hovering around somewhere around 40, 60. Oh, really? Okay. We, we're, we've made a special effort this afternoon yeah uh, but um she thinks that a lot of people are just going to show up okay um, so yeah i think that we'll probably get quite a few more than that uh, fire hydrant painting restoration weekend is may 11th and 12th 
uh, from 9 a.m. to noon being organized by the Parks and Recreation Department. Brisbane Dance Workshop will be doing their Midsummer Night Dream um, play um, on Saturday, May 18th and Sunday, May 19th at uh, Mission Blue. You can get tickets at brisbanedanceworkshop.org. And then finally, uh, I think we talked about this at the last um, meeting, uh, Toiletry Drive at City Hall and Brisbane Hardware during the month of May. Um, what's gathered will be assisting those in need at the Texas uh, border. And then um, don't have slides for it, but just to let you know that we're working with Caltrain to set up a time for them to come in and discuss their work um, or their, um, their planning process um, and their um, different scenarios that they're looking at and the impacts um, specifically on Bayshore Station, but just on the whole system. Um, and then high speed rail, I believe, is set for July 18th um, to come in and to talk, uh, to show us their um, preferred alternative that they will be uh, studying, I think, as early as this fall when they're in their um, environmental document. Okay. Mayor Council Matters, countywide assignments and subcommittee reports. Would anyone like to start? I can start then. Um, <laughs> You're ready. So Karen and I met for a public art advisory committee. Uh, we talked about relocating the plug park because the owner of that property wants us to do so. So we have indicated a temporary location behind the library um, in that sort of pocket park area. And then... Um, until we find a more permanent space, we want to prioritize a place where people would see it, see them easily. So we thought that behind the uh, library would be good for now just because it's um, secure. So there's a gate there and at nighttime somebody can't roll up their truck and steal all our fire hydrants. Uh, we also um, talked about getting art installations on a temporary basis so for example like a lot of the art that's created for burning man needs a place to live for the rest of the year and there aren't a lot of warehouse spaces to keep that and so cities um specifically san francisco has had essentially a lot of public art on loan where they've displayed it in public places um, and then it just rotates out so we thought brisbane could be a good place to have art on loan, for example, at the marina. Um, and then we also talked about how the Baylands development will generate millions and millions and millions of dollars for the public art ordinance. And so we thought it would be important to kind of come up with essentially a art master plan for the site. Um, because at this point, as things are getting built, it's really important to start thinking about the art component now, which is something that a lot of people actually haven't even thought of or discussed because there's so many other issues that are at the forefront of people's minds. But with that kind of budget, potentially of like $50 million, we really could create um, a plan that makes art feel cohesive throughout the development as opposed to a bunch of random statues just plop down somewhere. So, for example, like there could be almost a linear park or a high line type feel, which would be really important to indicate at the specific plan stage rather than have it be an afterthought. So that's something that's really integrated into the site. Um, so we are wanting to meet with UPC to discuss this and begin to do some visioning around what the art component will look like for the site. And we wanted to bring that to you to make sure that you don't have any big oppositions with the committee meeting with UPC to discuss just the art part. I don't have any problem. I'm not sure we can really discuss that in this situation, but um, isn't the public arts ordinance based on, you know, specific sites and they can either do it on site or yeah, or somewhere else. And so they can do it. Um, they can either put it in the in lieu of fund 
or they can kind of make the decisions around what happens with the art component. And in the case of Sangamo, we were really hands-off, where they kind of picked the artist, they picked the piece, and we just said, all right. But I think with a site that's this big, with that big of a budget, it'd probably be in the public's best interest for us to help guide that process if UPC is willing to have our input so that we don't, we might just kind of end up with something versus something that we are really excited about. So the hope is to think about art in the planning of the site instead of just ending up with something because it was just there to satisfy a requirement. Can, can we have discussion about this? I mean, I, I'd like to discuss it or bring it back to the council to discuss it because I think it's really important what you're saying. Because we just wanted to get your blessing and um, before we met with them, because I just, I don't know that we necessarily needed to do that, but we wanted to do that so that you didn't find out later and then get upset that we didn't tell you that we wanted to meet with them. Right. So maybe, um, uh, I, I think I would agree with what Madison is, is indicated in terms of what the intent tonight was, is just to notify the council of what you were doing. Um, I think there were a number of issues dealing with UPC in terms of the, 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 the planning process for this that we may want to bring back an item at some point to just talk it, it, it more globally about how we want to approach approach these. Um, some concerns I have in terms of just kind of um, approach as opposed to the substance. I have no issue with the substance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but we, we, um, uh, we can do that. In the meantime, I, I know Stuart and I have got a conversation with Jonathan next week just kind of approaching him on what the art subcommittee uh, was uh, discussing and um, and then we can kind of go from there but I think a more global conversation about all of these items I mean I'm thinking about the urban plan or the the affordable housing aspect um, the open space plan I mean there's a whole bunch of stuff that we need to kind of have a, a, a global I think approach on yeah and we just we don't even know what their appetite is yet but we were thinking that it would be important in the specific plan process to start thinking about the art and we could see with everything on their plate that might fall by the wayside so who knows if they have an appetite to even collaborate with us to that extent but we could see you know the need for a consultant that helps us build out a master plan um since it's such a big budget and such a big project and considering that the committee is newly formed and we haven't gone through a lot of this to have one of our first projects be the biggest we'll probably ever face it's important for us to start working on that now um so i guess however you want us if you want us to come back with this in some way shape or form but i just want to make sure the rest of the council was in the loop about what we wanted to do okay mm -hmm. so um we also had a cannabis meeting. Oh, Karen, was there anything that you wanted to add to that? Um, no, I just, I, I think part of our conversation was around community benefits. And so for us to put that forward, you know, what are the community benefits of art, et cetera. So that was, that was it. It was just part of why we were having the conversation. Yeah. That's it. Okay, so uh, cannabis, we met to discuss um, retail in commercial zones and looked at um, the taxation rates. That's something that we discussed at the council level that went back to the subcommittee. So we had discussions around that and a lot of discussions around equity and how would we try to promote small businesses being able to be a part of this mix. Also, not just the biggest um, companies and how we would also try and figure out a way to promote people of color or women um, who are entering this industry and just having that be part of our approach um, in how we determine who ends up being able to open a business, a cannabis business in Brisbane. So uh, still some work to do on that and we'll come back with our final proposal. So anything you want to add about that? No, I think it was a, a really good discussion and um, because there's such a steep learning curve um, for cities and over the whole legalization and retail, retail and everything, 
it, it's been very good to have these meetings and, and get more information from the public and, and really sort of hash out some of the problems we may see or the benefits we may see. So, And then finally, for my report, I had a PCE meeting. Um, they actually adjusted the JPA to allow for a director, two directors emeritus. So there were former um, council members that are no longer on their respective councils, but they were really involved with PCE. And so the board wanted to find a way to still have them have a seat at the table, although they will not impact um, quorum. So, and then there are certain things that they cannot vote on, or I don't know if they can vote on at all, but um, they appointed two people to that. I kind of mentioned Lori's name while I was there, and, and I haven't asked her if it's something that she wanted to do, but uh, she came to mind as somebody who I think would be really good in that role and somebody who loved PCE um, and was there for, this, for the beginning. But they went ahead and um, appointed the two people that they had already had in mind. So there may be opportunity. <laughs> well, because I said, hey, I think she would be good, but I haven't even, I don't even know if she wants to do it. But um, anyway, there might be opportunity for another director emeritus position. So I'm going to reach out to Lori and see if that's something she would want to do. Um, also, there's, they're switching to time of use billing. And so there's going to be a period of bill protection around that. So um, it's to promote people reducing energy at peak times, um, but that could get expensive for certain households. So I think it may be like a year of bill protection. Um, don't quote me on that. I don't have my notes from that meeting in front of me, so I'm just kind of going off memory. And then they also approved a $1.4 million um, EV dealer incentive over the next three years so that um, they'd have certain dealers in the Bay Area who sell electric vehicles to do an incentive with PCE or PCE would give like an additional rebate on people who bought the vehicles just to help motivate um, the sale of electric vehicles. And I guess it was really popular. The program was really popular um, the last few years that it's happened. So we're looking at n new dealerships to work with now going forward. Uh, and that's it for me. So <clears throat> if I could, Madam Mayor, then uh, Terry and I had a uh, infrastructure franchise and utility subcommittee meeting in regards to the uh, refuge rate from both uh, South San Francisco scavengers and recology. And we reviewed them and they both are in line with the the current contract and so we'll bring the recommendation forward in June okay economic development anything to add to that Terry no not at all hmm. all right you want to you want to do that one Karen no. oh okay so um, <laughs> <laughs> um yeah you know Mitch just gave us his, his update you know, uh, things are going well economically for Brisbane, which is nice. Uh, you know, we'll have the TOT uh, increase before us, and I'm sure we'll all agree to put it on the ballot and and make some additional money. Um, so we're currently at 12 percent, right? Uh, we're at 10 percent. So it'll go to 12 percent. Huh? 12 percent. Oh, we're at 12. Yeah. Oh, okay. 12 or 14. Oh, okay, good. So, um, you know, I um, had visited Kaliva's uh, facility. You did? I did. I didn't know that. Terry and I are going to try and get it. I did. So, uh, you know, worked in my schedule, and so I showed up there, and um, they were running a little late. And the reason being is that, you know, so I'm sitting in the lobby, and, and through the, you know, the, the door that you – leave when you're doing the tour you go in one door and you come out another is uh chief macias and uh, mario and uh, oh there's someone someone else i forgot her name in um, san jose they're at the san jose facility so they had just done the tour right before i was about to do the tour oh my gosh that's so funny so yeah no it was great and so uh larry ecker etcher larry so oh, anyways yeah 
Yeah, Larry. Thacker. Yeah, yes. Thacker. Yeah, so uh, he gave me a great tour, and um, yeah, really just, you know, top-notch professional operation. You know, we, we were talking, though, about how, you know, the state, you know, has implemented all these regulations on them and, you know, on the industry. <coughs> And, uh, you know, and they seem to be, you know, up for the challenge. But there's also just all the taxation on this brand new industry. Right? And you think about it, you know, I mean, here, you know, the state's getting a cut, you know, local municipalities can get a cut, and not just on the sale, but on the manufacturing, on the distribution, <laughs> right? And then, you know, uh, just thinking of these... Uh, uh, you know, the recent New York Times article where uh, Google doesn't pay any, I mean, not Google, but uh, Amazon doesn't pay any taxes. You know, uh, Facebook making $17 billion last quarter, right? And so, um, which kind of segues into um, the other thing that I've been working on, which is the Housing Legislative Working Group, which, which originally started out, out as the Casa Compact. And so we've been meeting once a week, at the MTC uh, uh, office building uh, in San Francisco. And so San Mateo County has put together, um, you know, this draft white paper and, you know, you know, saying to Scott Wiener and, and, and others, you know, especially in regards to SB 50 slash SB 4, because now they've kind of combined, um, that, you know, we're, we, we want to build housing. You know, we, we, we want to be a part of the solution, but we really don't like the one size fits all. And um, so, you know, we're looking at, you know, cities that um, already have master plans or specific plans or precise plans, they should be exempt from those types of bills. And that, um, you know, also you should allow cities to put forth uh, these master plans around their transit hubs and let cities work with their communities to figure out where dense housing is, you know, makes sense and is responsible and, uh, and, you know, and where it doesn't like in our residential, you know, like our R1 areas, leave that alone, right? Don't, just don't, you know, draw this big circle around the transit hub and say, okay, everyone's got to, to do this. Um, now, I don't know if there's any changes, Tom, you, you let me know, you know, with one of the add-ons for SB50 was a fourplex by right. Is that still uh, part of the, the deal? In current amendments, there'll be a lot more amendments. We're not going to know the final bill for a while. Yeah, so, you know, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Tom, you know, so you have the ADU uh, bills coming from Ting. So one of the concerns that was raised at the MTC meeting last night was, well, okay, if you have this fourplex by right, and then so you have each unit, and then you have these ADUs for each unit, you could potentially have eight units <laughs> on this, you know, regular-sized uh, lot. And I see you, you're, you're nodding. Uh, one of the, when we talked months ago, we talked about how the, uh, these bills and bills in the package and new bills, which this would be, are going to end up in litigation for years um, over interpretation. And one of the ones that I, th I think came up when the city was uh, threatened with litigation was this concept of your general plan says X, and then a developer comes in and tries to use that bill to say, well, I can go above your general plan by X percent um, because of one of these laws. and um, some people think that's been decided legal, I, legally. I'm not quite sure it has. We looked into it. But uh, long and short of it is, yes, there's going to be more coming. And things like that question that you just raised is one of the ones that we've talked about and a lot of people have talked about with the Housing Committee staff, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, that, that question was asked to Phil Ting uh, Friday night. I know you were there, Karen. and. He got kind of roasted, and he didn't even know about how the fourplex, you know, had an impact on his eighty, you know, ADU bills. He was just like, "Oh no, they're separate. The, you know, there's there's no issue, you know, with them." But anyways, um, 
that was entertaining. Yeah. So, uh, you know, and then just, you know, tr looking at these housing bills tied to, uh, you know, how you deal with infrastructure. How do you deal with services? How do you deal with transportation? You know, there's there's one of the things that, that Phil said was, uh, oh, we're going we're gonna to deal with the, the financing part later down down the line and right now we're just focused on you got to do the you got to you know uh streamline the the housing production process and so that that's been a big pushback uh, from cities and of course you know from from the folks that i uh, serve with in in san mateo county so our last meeting was yesterday before making the our recommendations to the ABAG and uh, MTC boards, and then we'll be back uh, on the 23rd to continue. So, um, okay. yeah. Anybody else? Okay, let's see. I'm gonna go to my calendar so I can remember what all I did. Um, I attended a airport land use planning committee meeting last week and it was semi-uneventful. We approved a project for Millbright. And then I attended a local policymaker group, which is High Speed Rail and Caltrain advisory group. And we're working on their business plan uh, update as far as getting information about it. It's still appears that Brisbane, even with the high growth scenario, is going to be an underutilized uh, station. And it's, it's going to be interesting to see if there is the amount of development that's proposed under Measure JJ, if any of that would change um, as far as what traffic and train uh, implications would be and whether Caltrain on the corridor would be able to really service the Bayshore station with the amount of trains that they have um, and what the capacity is going to be. We did get an update on high-speed rail. They did say that they are coming back to a, a meeting in September where they will give us their final preferred um, track alignment so we would have an idea at that point and I think we'll have um, a smaller meeting before then where they will be giving their opinion on where they would prefer to have a rail yard probably in Brisbane um, so that's an interesting scenario that's all coming up you know on on the high-speed rail and Caltrain. And then just earlier tonight, we had a subcommittee meeting on the Sierra Point design guidelines and uh, the developers of the HCP project came in with some possible changes and uh, Cliff and I discussed with them how that may work and if there were any other ideas that they could come back to us before they went to planning commission with their proposed changes mm -hmm. i think that's probably it okay uh moving on to city council meeting schedule please note the city council meeting of may 16th is canceled and we have scheduled a special meeting on monday june 3rd in a large conference room to interview applicants to fill our committee vacancies. The next regular scheduled council meeting will be on June 6th. That brings us to written communications. I have one communication from Karen Cunningham on May 2nd regarding the tree ordinance. And that brings us to oral communications number two. Seeing no one in the room, I'll move to adjournment in memory of Yvonne Creason. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 